Manic Depressive was a label that Tom Wilkerson lived with for most of his adult life. He didn't like that label, but it was better than the other one that became more common during his time. Bipolar sounded so mechanical, like when he was inspecting a house and discovered an outlet that wasn't wired right. He would write in his little inspection book, Out outlet wired incorrectly, polarity reversed. Both labels conjured up people locked away in a dingy asylum where everybody was just labeled crazy. He didn't hear voices. He didn't see things that weren't there. He just had these mood swings. He was either full of energy and vitality and creativity, or he was entertaining dark thoughts that prevented him from seeing the world in a positive light. Positive or negative, reverse polarity, not wired right, bipolar. It was a dilemma that Tom lived with. Tom's dilemma never kept him from holding down a job, though. He worked as a building inspector in Craig County since he graduated from college. And over the past five years, he served as the county's chief building inspector. So it's not like his condition kept him from being successful. In fact, if anything, the mania drove him to success. When he was up, he could survive on little sleep. He could run circles around his co-workers and, and multitask. He was innovative, creative, a master at problem solving. That was the good side of the mania. The bad side was his impulsivity and his tendency to run off at the mouth. There were many days that ended badly after Tom uttered the words, Hey, y'all, watch this. He'd make a split-second decision that made no sense at all, leaving those around him thinking, That boy ain't right. The downtimes were another issue. There were days when Tom could hardly get out of bed, and when he did, he couldn't get his thoughts together to accomplish anything. He had no energy. He would walk 50 feet and have to sit down to rest. He would forget people's names. He would forget how to do simple tasks, so he would have to farm these tasks out to his employees. That's when the dark thoughts came. He felt helpless. Hopeless. He felt like he served no purpose in this world that seemed so full of pain and violence and disappointment. Even though he never attempted to take his own life, he longed for a reprieve from this unfair and fallen world. At least when he was down. Then a week later, a day later, even an hour later, he would be back up again soaring over the heads of his co-workers and his families and his friends. Nobody really knew what to expect from Tom from one minute to the next. One fellow who was working with him said, you know, it's like he has a twin or something. And I don't know which one's going to come to work that day. So when Tom would come to work on one of his depressive days, his co-workers referred to him as the twin. Uh-oh, better be on your toes. Tom didn't come to work today. It's his twin. They thought he didn't know about that nickname, but he did. As much as he tried to hide it, folks knew that Tom wasn't wired right. Reverse polarity, bipolar, manic depressive. It was hard not to let his condition define him. And yet there it was. 
He spent many hours in church praying that God would take away this condition. But his doctor kept telling him, Tom, this is not a condition that's going to go away. This is a disease that you are going to have to manage for the rest of your life. That didn't stop Tom from praying, though. So one day, Tom met the famous traveling preacher, Ben Carpenter, at a revival. He heard that Ben was a healer, and he thought, well, if this is a disease like my doctor said, maybe, just maybe, this Ben Carpenter can heal me. So we went to the revival, and afterwards, he was surprised to see that Ben sought him out. Ben even asked Tom to travel with him. And Tom said, how in the world can I do this? I am sick. I have a disease. And Ben said, Tom, you have a gift. How many people do you know that can revel and celebrate the creativity that God has given you? And yet also rely and lean on God when you have nothing left to give. That's a gift. So Tom made a decision that night. A lot of folks just wrote it off as one of Tom's crazy, impulsive decisions. He quit his job and went to travel with Ben Carpenter. So for three years, Tom was a part of Ben's inner circle. Although he didn't exactly stand out among the group. Pete and Andy Fisher and those biker boys from up in the holler, Jim and John, they were the ones that seemed to be out on the front lines. But Tom, he found more in common with Bart and Andy, uh, two of Ben's followers that kind of did more of the -the behind-the-scenes ministry. Ben's disciples traveled all over West Virginia and Virginia, mostly in rural areas, but occasionally they'd go to a city for a revival. It seemed that wherever they went, though, they either got in trouble with the law or they got in trouble with a group of country club churches that were more concerned about looking good than doing good. After a few years on the road, it became quite clear that both of these institutions would do anything to silence Ben Carpenter and his followers. After all, they were a threat to the way things had always been. One day, Ben announced that he was going to go to West Virginia's state capital, Charleston. Pete Fisher objected. He said, do you realize, Ben, that the last time you went there, they tried to kill you, and you want to go there again? Ben says, I know. The last time I went there, they tried to kill me, and it is likely that they will want to kill me again. And it is also likely that this time they will succeed. And this hush went over Ben's followers, except for the normally quiet and reserved Tom, who jumped up and said, well then, what are we waiting for? Let us go and die with him. Jim, the biker, leaned over to his brother and whispered, "Uh uh-oh. (laughs) Looks like the twin came out to play tonight. (laughs) Normally, John would have chuckled at his brother's remark, but the gravity of Ben's statement kept him from doing so. So on the way to Charleston, Tom kept wondering, why in the world did I stand up and blurt that out? The incident just kept playing over and over in his head like a recording stuck on repeat. Every time it played in his head, Tom cursed himself and cursed his disease. But over and over, Ben kept hinting at his eventual death. It seems like every healing and teaching moment uh, during that time was directed towards his followers to prepare them for the possibility of carrying on the ministry without Ben. But Tom kept quiet. He said, if I keep saying things like I did, people are going to think I'm suicidal. So he kept quiet. 
But the anxiety in his heart increased every day. It increased when Ben prepared a meal for them and washed their feet. It increased when he told them to not let their hearts be troubled. Tom thought, that explains every day of my life. My heart is always troubled. And you're telling me not to let my heart be troubled? I give anything for my troubled heart to be quiet for just five minutes. Finally, the night came when the authorities came to arrest Ben Carpenter. Jude, the one who handled the ministry's finances, ratted on Ben and told them where he would be. And the authorities came and arrested Ben. There was a brief scuffle between Pete and the cops. And that's when Tom and most of the other followers fled. Tom was afraid, but he was also angry with himself. How typical. One day I'm saying I'm willing to die with Ben, and then I run when he needs me the most. So Tom went into a deep, deep depression. He holed himself up in this seedy little hotel outside of Charleston. He didn't eat. He didn't sleep, although he couldn't muster the energy to get out of bed. He couldn't recall simple shapes. He couldn't recall things even like faces or flowers. He felt worthless, a waste of resources, a waste of air. What was he going to do? He quit his job so suddenly that it was unlikely that he would find a job in his field again. He would probably have to flip burgers or wait tables or greet people at the local Walmart just to earn enough money to make it by. Tom's mind was on this downward spiral to nowhere. Grief and despair closed in on him like a black cloud. And finally, after a couple of days, he got the energy enough to turn on the television. And the news confirmed his worst fear. They indeed killed Ben Carpenter. In fact, not only did they kill Ben Carpenter, they executed him publicly for the world to see. A clear message that this is what happens when you mess with the monster born of the union of church and state. And to add insult to injury, the reporter said Ben's body had been stolen. Tom finally checked out of the motel. He wasn't sure where he was going to do, go. He was not sure what he was going to do. Because the last time he felt fully alive was on that night when Ben shared that last meal with his inner circle. And so Tom decided that he was going to go to that place. Because maybe just seeing that place would help him recall the face of his teacher. Because every day that went by, the face of Ben Carpenter faded from his mind. So when he arrived at the house, he was surprised to see all the other ones there. Well, everyone except Jude. The odd thing was, they all seemed excited, cheerful even. Jim ran up to him and said, Tom, where have you been? You missed it. Tom said, I missed what? He said, Ben was here. You missed Ben. The others seemed to be going along with it too. And Tom said, you all quit messing with me. You think I don't know about him being executed? It was all over the news. Pete said, but he's back, really. And Tom said, I refuse to play along with this little fantasy. I know you all are lying to me. I know you all are trying to get even with me for bugging out. But they kept insisting. He says, listen, until I see this for myself, I call bullpucky on your story. And the others looked at him and said, 
Tom, what are you going to do? He said, I don't know. Pete said, well, why don't you just hang out with us until you sort things out? Tom didn't know where else to go or what else to do, so he stayed. And a week later, when they were all gathered in that main room, Ben appeared. And Tom was shocked. He didn't believe it at first. He said, you know, this is it. I am finally seeing things, and they are going to lock me away in the nuthouse. The problem is, everyone else saw Ben too. Ben walked towards Tom, and the only thing Tom could manage to say was, Oh my God. Ben said, Go ahead, touch me. Tom did, and he felt the marks on Ben's body, the evidence that he had indeed been executed. Do you believe me now? Ben asked. Yes, said Tom. Then help spread the word to those who haven't seen so that they might believe too. Tom said, Ben, a part of me died when I found out you died. Ben said, I know, just like you promised. Come rise with me. Reading John 20. Jesus appears to the disciples. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side, and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord, but he said to them, Unless I see the mark and nails of the nails on his hands, and put my fingers on the mark of the nails, and my hand on his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the, although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. And he said to Thomas, Put your fingers here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it on my side. Do not doubt, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet come to believe. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and through believing you may have life in his name. Our hymn of invitation this morning.